Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. I want to encourage you to open them to Genesis 36. Genesis 36, as you're finding your place there in God's Word, I want to welcome Reach Church DeSoto with us this morning. So grateful for the work that God is doing there. Pastor Ryan, Pastor Josh, God is growing as uh, that work out there in DeSoto. If you ever get a chance on a weekend and you're out that way, go join up with them and and see what God is doing there. I know you'll be blessed by it. Also want to welcome the venue service meeting right down the hall and also our all of our online viewers. Many of you are joining us online this morning. We're so grateful that you're able to worship with us today. 2013, um, Hugo, Oklahoma high school basketball team was playing Millwood High School basketball team for a chance to go to the state tournament. And they're playing uh, this game. There's, there's three seconds left in the game. Hugo is up by one point. It's a timeout that's called and they go and come out of the timeout. They're inbounding the ball near midcourt. Hugo has the ball. All they really have to do is inbound the ball and the game is over. Hugo uh, throws the ball in. One of their players was able to break free. He's open the backcourt, receives the basketball. Beautiful over-the-shoulder catch. The basketball goes right in front of him. He dribbles up, almost dunks it, goes up and just lays the thing right in. He's ecstatic, only to realize he scored the wrong goal. And Millwood won the game and went on to the state tournament. Now that guy, listen, he was successful, but he was successful in the wrong direction. He was successful in the wrong goal. You know, Howard Hendricks used to say that the great fear for the Christian is not failure. The great fear for the Christian is succeeding at the wrong things. To climb the ladder of success only to realize that you leaned it against the wrong building. In Genesis 36, we look at the, the genealogy of Esau this morning. You might be wondering, what in the world could we possibly gain from this chapter I think to some extent we need to camp out here because Esau is a picture of worldly success. Everything about his life is remarkably attractive. He'll be successful in every way possible according to the world's eyes, and yet ultimately and eternally his life is a failure because he succeeded at the wrong things. So every one of us this morning, to some extent, we're going to walk through a graveyard. You ever kind of walk through a graveyard and just looked at those headstones, people you don't know? All you see is some dates. You don't know how they lived. But you walk through that graveyard, and it's a good reminder as to what's really important in your life, what you're really pursuing. This morning, we're going to walk through the graveyard of Esau's lives, these men who we don't really know. Their names have been, for the most part, completely forgotten. But all of us will be forced to ask the question, what are we ultimately pursuing? What is success for us? What path are we on? Success in the world's eyes, that's, that's visible, it's, it's, it's momentary, it's very attractive, but it's momentary. Or success in the eyes of God, that is oftentimes a whole lot less visible, but it's eternal. And this is really, I, I think, Jacob's final test. Surrounded by a brother who's prospering and flourishing as he blatantly disobeys God. And the question is, will Jacob remain faithful? Will he patiently wait upon the fulfillment of God's promise? Will he die in faith just like Abraham and Sarah, trusting God for something more than the soil that he was living on? Will he cling tightly to God in the midst of a world and a current that's going the opposite direction? And you know what we're seeing again? We, we've seen this throughout Genesis. There's these two paths. The path of the world, the path of Satan, the path of God that leads to heaven. And all of us need to decide this morning, which path are we on? With that in mind, let me pray for us and then we'll, we'll look at some of this chapter. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we're so grateful that you have revealed yourself to us in your word. So we could know more about who you are. We could have never have known you had you not revealed yourself to us. God, I pray that you would teach us and instruct us by your word this morning. Even a chapter like 36 is a reminder that all scripture 
is God-breathed. And it's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction. So teach us this morning, Lord, by means of your spirit. Teach us, correct us. Help us to align our lives with your word and with your will. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As you've seen this, um, you should know enough about me that you know I'm not going to try to pronounce all these words. All right? I'm from Oklahoma. It's so lucky I can pronounce my own name, you know. So we're not even going to attempt that. But I want you to get an overview of this chapter. If you look there in verses 1 and 2, you see that Esau is going to take wives. Whenever you see Esau in Scripture, we've talked about this before, he's always presented as a carnal man, as a fleshly man. He has no desire for the things of God. Whenever you see Esau, you see a man who's always focused more on the immediate and the earthly rather than the spiritual and the eternal. This is the guy who sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. He traded the eternal for the earthly. He traded the spiritual for the physical. And what you're seeing here is that he continues this kind of lifestyle throughout his life. He's going to take multiple wives. And we know that Jacob as well took multiple wives. wives. But know this, whenever you see that in Scripture, it's always sinful. It's always disobedient to God's Word. And it always leads to disastrous consequences. But Esau not only takes multiple wives, but he takes Canaanite wives. He, he married, as we've already been made aware, he, he marries an Ishmaelite, a daughter of Ishmael, which was blatantly disobedient to God's word and, and uh, disobedient to the instruction of his parents. You see a young man here who has shrugged off the The admonition of his parents, his grandfather, his father, he shrugged off the word of God and he said, I'm just going to live however I want to live. He thumbs his nose at God and says, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to pursue as much earthly pleasure as I possibly can. And you see that kind of life and you see that kind of attitude and you would expect as you kind of pick up the following verses, you would expect to read about all the hardships and all the trials and all the difficulties that he faces as he disobeys God. But what do you actually see? He has very little problems. In fact, you read on in verses 4 and 5, he has five sons. And missing from that account is any struggle with barrenness. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all three had issues with barrenness in their wives. But not Esau. You you ever scratch your head at this? You see a couple that's, man, they've sought to do it God's way and live God's way. And they get married and they're they're following God and living obedience. And yet they have uh, struggles having children. And you see somebody else over here living blatant disobedience and sin. And they got no problems. And you say, God, what in the world's going on here? Esau's got no difficulty. He has five sons. You, you get into verses 6 and 8. Verse 6, then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household and his livestock and all his cattle and all his goods, which he had acquired in the land of Canaan. And he went to another land away from his brother Jacob. For their property had become too great for them to live together in the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir, and Esau is Edom. You see a guy here who's not only having kids, but he's acquiring a lot of stuff. He's becoming incredibly wealthy. In fact, he's now got so much stuff, he's got to find a different place to live. He's not having trouble. He's getting wealthy. He's got to live in in a different area because the land can't sustain both he and Jacob. And then you look in verses 10 through 14... And those five sons now have ten grandsons. So you got five sons, ten grandsons. This family is prospering in the things of the world. You get down to verse 15, and these boys become chieftains. They become chiefs. There's some discrepancy on that word. Some of your translation may say princes, but there's no doubt these are boys of position and power and prestige. So they're not only wealthy, they've become powerful and influential. And then it records how they begin to dominate the land. They're conquering other people groups. 
And then you look in, in verse 31, you get down there and it says, Now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. The boys not only become princes, they become kings. They're establishing a succession of monarchies. They're becoming a great nation. What was the promise of God to Jacob? You're going to become a great nation. And yet they're floundering. And Esau has no promise. And he's flourishing. He's becoming a great nation. He's establishing this vast kingdom and monarchy. And and where is Jacob? Look in chapter 37, verse 1. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. So Esau is living in Edom. Jacob is living in Canaan. Esau is living in palaces. Jacob is living in tents. Esau's sons are princes and powerful politicians. And uh, Jacob's sons are shepherds. Esau's sons are leading men. Jacob's sons are following sheep. Esau's sons are stepping on people. And Jacob's sons are stepping in manure. And you don't think that was somewhat difficult on Jacob? I mean, I like to do these things. I don't know if they occur. But just imagine Jacob and Esau meeting up for Thanksgiving. You know, and Jacob saying, Esau, how's the family? Well, Bella's king now. And Jobab, he's next in line. And just graduated from Sierra University. Top of his class. Boy, that boy is smart. And hey, Dad, I don't know if you heard, on the west end of the territory, he just built a new palace. And that terrace, whoo, the view from that place is amazing. And Esau looking at Jacob and saying, I I see you still got that limp. Never healed up, did it? I I heard your boys, they destroyed Shechem. And then God got mad. Boy, that's a bad deal. Do you know what we do? Whatever we want to do. And do you know what God does? Who cares? We just live however we want to live and do whatever we want to do. Jacob, smells like you're still tending those sheep, aren't you? Eh, Noble profession. And guess somebody, we need some shepherds around. We need somebody to do that kind of work. Guess that's good for some folks. Boy, that whole birthright deal came with some fine print, didn't it? How's that working out for you? I guess you're still trusting God, huh? Well, you know, that's good for some folks to do that whole religion thing. But you know what I think? I think I'm just going to take my goodies now. I'm just going to live for me. And it sure seems like, Jacob, it's working out pretty well. Now, I don't know if, if that conversation ever took place, but rest assured, I think Jacob was very much aware of the prosperity of his brother Esau, who was promised no blessing. And there is Esau prospering in all the stuff of this world. And I'm wondering if Jacob didn't occasionally wonder, God, did I make the right decision in putting all my eggs in your basket? I wonder if Jacob didn't occasionally wonder, why didn't God, why why didn't Esau struggle? Why do I get kicked in the pants? (laughs) And and everything seems to work out okay. don't, Don't we... Don't we want that sometimes when you see somebody acting in blatant disobedience to God's word and doing things they shouldn't do and you just say, God, why don't you just strike them dead right now? You know, anybody ever cut you off in traffic and say, God, just strike, at least put a police officer over the corner, you know? But God doesn't work that way, does he? He doesn't immediately, in fact, we got to be careful for saying, God, where's your justice? Because God might say, well, let's just begin with you. But God doesn't bring immediate justice, and he doesn't bring immediate rewards to our obedience, does he? And sometimes we begin to scratch our head and say, God, what's going on here? I I think Jacob struggled. Certainly we know he struggled with his flesh, but I'm sure there was parts of him that just said, God, I'd like a little heaven right now. I know I got the promise, but why can't I enjoy a little right now? And it's hard to swim against the current of worldly success when you're when you're living with a bunch of Edomites. And so I think this this might be Jacob's greatest test. While the world around him is flourishing in the temporary things, 
will he stay faithful to God and patiently wait for the fulfillment of God's promise? And, and in many ways, it's our greatest test too. The world around us, more often than not, they're, they're floating downstream, and it seems easy. And sometimes you think, boy, they, it sure looks like they're having a whole lot of fun. They're enjoying the goodies while we're patiently laboring and struggling with our flesh and seeking to go against the current. And we're reminded of Matthew chapter 7 that says, For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. And, and we struggle to stay on this narrow path. And, and so what I want to do just briefly here this morning is, and, and you know this, preaching is personal for me. God's been working on me. So uh, maybe he's working on you this morning. But I want to share with you some, some tips, I think, that are so important for us if we're going to stay faithful to God in the midst of an Edomitic culture. We're going to stay faithful to God on this path that leads to life. What are some tips? Uh, let me give, just give you some, some principles. First of all, at some point or another, you've got to settle the issue in your mind. You've got to, at some point, settle the issue in your mind as to what path you're going to go down. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you're going to follow Jesus, he says there's a requirement. And the requirement is that you have to die. Not physically, but you have to die to yourself and your own desires and your own dreams so that you might live fully and completely under Christ. In other words, you've got to burn the ships. Yeah, I, I, I think we continually see this struggle in Jacob's life. I, I know I do. He meets up with God on the way to Bethel as he's going to Laban, and God begins that work there. But Jacob still has this struggle. He still wants uh, physical blessing. It, it, it appears to me Jacob is always clinging to and grasping after physical blessing, but he also wants the blessing of God. He wants them both. I mean, the, the part of the motivation behind him leaving Laban was, God, I want to establish my own family. I want to have my own stuff. And he comes to the fort of the Jabbok, and he comes to a place of saying, God, all I really want is you. I will not let go of you until you bless me. But he even comes out of that, and what happens two chapters later? He's living in Shechem. He gets sucked in by the stuff of this world, and it leads to disastrous consequences. And God has to break him again. But what we see throughout Jacob's life is God refining him and bringing to him, him to a place where Jacob only desires Christ. That the master passion of his life becomes faithfulness to the Lord. And I think of David. David who God had to refine him in the same things. But you remember after David sins with Bathsheba in Psalm 51. Do you remember what David writes? He says, create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit from me. Don't cast me away from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I love that part because you know what David is saying there? God, you can take anything you want out of my life, but I can't lose you. I, can't, I can live without everything else in this world, but I can't live without you. He was bringing David to a place where the master passion of his life was faithfulness. I must be faithful to you. And there's no way that a Christian can truly enjoy the fullness of Christ until you settle the issue in your heart that your master passion is Christ and faithfulness to him. You know, I think one of the reasons that you see so many defeated Christians, Christians who are firing on two cylinders instead of eight, is because they've never settled the issue. They're miserable. That they got too much of Christ to ever be satisfied in the world, too much of the world to ever be fully satisfied in Christ. They're living with feet in both worlds, and they're miserable. And I think the mindset, the temptation is always, well, I'm going to love Jesus, but I'm also going to make it my master passion to pursue as much stuff in this world as I can. I want them both. I'm going to love Jesus, and I'm going to try to make as much money as I can. And you know what Jesus says? You can't serve two masters. Either you love the one and hate the other. You, hate the one, you love the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't have two owners. 
And the issue, I, you, you've heard me say this many times, the issue is not money, it's not stuff. You can have much, you can have little. It's the example of Paul in Philippians. I've learned the secret. Being well fed and going hungry, having abundance and suffering need, I can do all things through Christ. Meaning, it doesn't matter if I have much stuff or little stuff, as long as I got Jesus, I'm going to be just fine. It's not about stuff, it's about Christ. It's about him being the master passion and the, and the Lord of your life. You, you can't live with feet in both kingdoms. Jesus doesn't play second fiddle. And he won't lead from the second chair. I know many of you as Christians, you're here this morning and in many ways you're playing games. Some of you, you're single, you call yourself a Christian, but you're playing around in sexual immorality and drunkenness. Can I just encourage you this morning, get real. Either be a Christian or be an atheist, but make a choice. Stop living with feet in both kingdoms. Some of you husbands, you call yourself a Christian, but you aren't living it. You're indulging the desires of the flesh. You aren't reading your Bible. You're not leading your family spiritually. You aren't a Christ-like example to your children. You're not loving your wife like Christ loved the church. Make a choice. If you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. Ladies, you get caught up in every feministic stuff that comes your way. If you're going to be a Christian woman, be a Christian woman. Take a stand, get hated, martyr, die, and go and be with Jesus. But be a Christian woman. Go one way or the other. Some of you, you call yourself a Christian. You've never told anyone about Jesus. You, you don't have any desire to get trained to do it. You've never told anybody about Christ because you're more consumed with the stuff of this world. Make a choice. If you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. But stop playing games. Settle the issue. Secondly, remember you're a pilgrim, not a possessor. You're a pilgrim, not a possessor. Look in chapter 36, verse 43. It says, these are the chiefs of Edom. That is Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. So here's the land. Here's the stuff that they had. And all that they had was on this side of glory. This was their stuff, their possessions. Then look in chapter 37, verse 1. We've already read it, but now Jacob lived in a land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. Esau was a possessor. Jacob was a pilgrim. Esau was living in a palace. Jacob was living in a tent. In fact, the only time that Jacob owned a home, God kicked him out of it and said, cut it out. Go live in a tent and Bethel. Why? Because God wanted to give Jacob a constant reminder that this is not your home. This is not as good as it gets. I mean, can you imagine? This is the, the promised child. This is the child of promise, and he never had a home. But neither did his grandfather Abraham. And, and you're, you know, if you're like me, you ask what got him through. And Scripture tells us of Abraham, at least, that he never settled down because he was looking for a city with foundations, a city whose builder and maker was God. In other words, Abraham knew, and I think Jacob knew, that as good as the promised land was, there was something better coming. And that's us. This world can be very attractive, but as attractive as it can be, there's something better than this. I don't know about you. I love Olathe, the Kansas, but I don't want to live here eternally. I'm hoping there's something better coming. And as Paul said to Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble estate into conformity with the body of his glory. And so knowing this, it changes the way we live, right? It changes the way we think. It changes the decisions that we make. And it doesn't mean, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that we don't enjoy some of what God has given to us. I can make a greater biblical argument for enjoying what God has given to us than hoarding what God has given to us. But this does mean that we have a correct view of stuff. 
That we know that all this stuff is going to pass away. That we don't trust in the stuff of this world. We don't get our ultimate joy from the stuff of this world. We don't attempt to get this stuff to do something that it was never intended to do. And by the way, I think it's very good for us as families to occasionally sit down and we need to make sure that we're grateful for what God has given to us because all of us in this room in comparison to the world are enormously wealthy. In comparison with history, we're enormously wealthy. And we ought to be grateful for what God has given to us. But occasionally, just occasionally, we need to sit down with our families and say, we're grateful for what God has given to us here on this side of glory. But we also know that one day it's going away. All this stuff ruts, rusts, rots, and fades. It's going to go away. And all we will have is Jesus. And that's okay, because he's all we want anyway. So we know we're... We're not possessors, we're pilgrims, strangers and aliens. You know, 25% of your Bible is unfulfilled prophecy. 25% of your Bible is telling you about things that you'll probably never see with these earthly eyes, but one day you'll know by faith in Jesus Christ. You see, we trust in a God who was a man who died on a cross for our sins rose and ascended he's crowned with glory and honor he's seated at the right hand of the throne of god you know what he's doing right now he's gathering a people to himself and one day he's coming back and he will appear and every eye will see him and there's going to be a battle and it's going to be a very quick battle and you don't want to be on the wrong side of that battle and he will set up his kingdom and it'll have no end And those who know him will rule and reign with him. And until that time, I'll do my best to live like Abraham, Jacob, and Daniel. Like Daniel, I'll do my best to be a good citizen and a worker for Nebuchadnezzar and Darius. But my eye and my heart are towards the Son of God and my heavenly home. I will not bow to another idol. I will pray when I want to pray. I will raise my children in the things of God. The pagan will not raise my children. The Canaanite will not raise my children. I will preach, I will pray, and I will protest if necessary. But all the time, I'll be looking to the sky for the blessed appearing of my Savior, Jesus Christ. I will live in this world, but I will not trust it. Because my citizenship is in heaven. And my ultimate hope is Christ. I'm a pilgrim, not a possessor. You know, the only real possession that we have, the only real possession we have is the promise of heaven and being with Christ. You know, the story goes of a father had three sons, lived down in a valley surrounded by mountains, a big mountain, this major mountain out in front of them. He gathered his three boys up and said, whoever can climb the highest on the mountain will take over for me. You'll have all my possessions. First son climbed up that mountain and brought back a bristle cone. And he said to his father, I climbed up to where the large, tall pines grow. And I brought you back this bristle cone. He said, great job, son. Way to go. Second son went out and climbed up really high, came back, and he brought a feather. And he said, dad, I climbed up beyond those big tall pines up to where the eagles fly and I brought you back this feather. Dad said, boy, that's great. Third son climbed up, came back down, had nothing in his hands. He said, Dad, all I have is a vision of what's on the other side. Isn't that us as Christians? All we really have is a vision of what's on the other side. We're pilgrims, not possessors. Then finally, remember, always remember that the final chapter has not been written. In terms of, well, Jacob is way behind his brother. Esau has a numerous race of princes and politicians while while Jacob's family, just a bunch of shepherds. Esau, Esau's way more famous than Jacob. And even if you play it out to their end of their lives, it doesn't even out. Jacob, at the end of his life, has about 70 descendants living under Pharaoh's leadership. 
You, you can even take Israel out even further. You get to Moses' day, 400 years later, and Israel is just a fledgling little nation of slaves who have recently escaped the bondage of Egypt, and, and they still have no land of their own. Edom, on the other hand, that 400 years later, they're an established nation. In fact, they had the power to refuse Israel's passage through their land. You remember that? Moses and Israel go to Edom and say, can we pass through your land? If we take anything, we consume anything, we'll pay you back. And what do the Edomites say? Nope, can't do it. I'm not going to let you go through. And boy, you look at this and all the while you say, boy, this is a child of promise. And it appears to me that Esau and the Edomites are winning. But what do we know? God, not man, writes the final chapter. It isn't a democracy. You don't vote on the ending. And so today, what do we know? Nobody talks about Edom, but Israel's in the news every day. These men who were famous back then, they passed off the scene and they were soon forgotten. Fame is a fleeting thing. The nation of Edom, you get to David's day, you know what David does? He beats them like a borrowed mule. He just wears them out. And there's actually a whole book of the Bible devoted to the destruction of Edom. Y'all read it all the time. I know you do. What book is it? Obadiah, one of your favorites, right? I know y'all stay in it all the time. Obadiah, they, you know what they do? They go hole up in a little area called Petra. They live in the rocks. It's a, almost an impenetrable area. But guess what? When God wants to bring a nation down, he can bring a nation down any way he wants to. But there is a remnant of the Edomite race that endures to the time of Christ. Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, both of them Idumeans, they are Edomites. Herod the Great, you remember, he's the one that slaughtered all the babies in an effort to kill the Messiah. Herod Antipas is the one who beheaded John the Baptist. But the, 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 final, the final confrontation between the Edomites and the Jacobites, you remember that confrontation? You know what it is? It's Herod and Jesus. You remember Jesus on trial before Pilate? Pilate realizes, hey, you're not under my jurisdiction. You need to go see Herod. And he goes over there to see Herod. And Herod is a multi, multi, multi millionaire. He's a powerful, influential politician who is extremely wealthy. And before him stands who? Jesus. Jesus has nothing. A Jewish carpenter. And Herod plays with him a little bit and sends him away. But how does that story end? Herod, he's going to die in exile, a horrific death. Jesus, he's going to go to that cross. He will die. On the third day, he will rise from the dead. He will ascend to the Father, and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And one day, he will come on the clouds of heaven. And the nations are his inheritance. And he'll rule them with a rod of iron, and he shall shatter them like earthenware God not man writes the final chapter we've read the end of the book amen we know how this deal ends so as you're living in a world where it seems like the Edomites are winning and it appears that the people of God are losing just remember the war is not over and this is so important. I, I, you know, here recently I've been able to talk to some young individuals who have recently gone, they've gone all in with Christ. And you know one of the greatest struggles that they face? Is they go home to their parents, oftentimes who are not believers, and their parents and their family, they don't share their same values. And they've gone all in with Christ. And family and friends who don't share their values and don't understand the way they're living, they can sometimes say some very mean and hurtful things. And then they look over there, and oftentimes they see these people who are flourishing. And they think, what's going on? But listen, this really is the story of Christians. I just thought of two this week. We could think of many more. Uh, three, actually, but you're uh, Betsy Tinboon, the sister of Corey Tinboon. She mentored Corey Tinboon. She dies 
a horrific death in a concentration camp. Now, if I had been God, I'd have rescued her and let her marry a godly man and have about 15 kids and about 100 grandkids. And you say, what's going on? Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell um, turned down a whole lot of wealth, Olympic champion, to be a missionary. He was taken prisoner in a Japanese internment camp. Right before he was in prison, he was able to get his wife and kids out. 42 years old. He wasted away in a four by six prison cell and died without any medical aid of a brain tumor. Jim Elliott. 28-year-old man who loves the Lord. Godly wife seeking to reach an unreached tribe. And in the process is killed by the people he was attempting to save. But you know what? With all of those stories... The words of Jim Elliot ring true. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We can't keep any of this stuff anyway. Let's go all in with Christ. The Edomite way, it looks appealing. But the ultimate destination is destruction. And I'm here to tell you today, you go the Jacobite way, the way of Christ and faithfulness to him. I'll tell you this much, it's not always easy. And there are days that are going to be really, really hard if you're going to cling to Christ. And you're going to have to fight with your flesh and swim against the current. But there is eternal glory at the end of this path. It's worth it. So let me just ask you, I mean, I just want to make this as practical as I could this morning. What kind of success are you pursuing? What are your goals? If you're a a college student, if you're about to be a high school graduate, or or maybe you're a college student right now, you're about to graduate, what what are the ultimate goals? What are you pursuing? Is it merely a job? Is your goal to make a lot of money or to make a difference for Christ? And your goals really make all the difference. Parents, what are the top three things you want to teach your children before they leave your home? And then are those three things, are they earthly or eternal? Are are they physical principles or spiritual principles? Is your goal and your prayer for your children that they graduate college, get a good job, make a lot of money? Or is your goal for your children that they find ultimate fulfillment in the joy of of following and trusting Jesus Christ. And then grandparents, I go to a lot of funerals. And, and really, I'll, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times it is so sad because all that's really said of these individuals, because sometimes, a lot of times, I don't know them that well. And I say, family, y'all are going to have to get up here and you want some personal testimony. You know, you, some of you got to have to speak. And you know what they get up so many times? Well... They love to play golf, really good golfer. Took care of their yard, really nice. Had some antique cars they really like. Nothing wrong with those things. But listen, if that's all you got to say about me, make something else up. You know what I mean? Just come up with something. What are your goals? What, 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 what legacy are you leaving? Have you walked through a graveyard lately and been reminded of what's really valuable? And do two things. Number one, write out your testimony. you got to stay close to Jesus. I think one of the things that's so important for us is to remember the grace of God in our lives and the salvation that we receive. The great danger for most of us as Christians is that the further you get away from the moment of salvation, the more you start to think you're something pretty special. And maybe God owes you something for all your faithfulness and obedience. And so you're getting really mad because he ain't giving you no goodies right now. And you start to recount to him all the things you've done. And do you know what you need to go back and do? 
remind yourself that all you really deserve is death and hell. And he didn't have to save you, but he did by his grace. And now we give him back our life in faith and trust, knowing that the real promise we have is heaven. But you, if you stay close to Christ, and this I'm speaking to myself as well, we sing that in the hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. You know, the more you focus on Jesus, who he is, and what he's done for you, the things of this earth just grow strangely dim in light of his glory and his grace. Then secondly, and I mean this, write your obituary. I'm being dead serious. You need to write your obituary today. Write out. Somebody's going to have to write it. You might as well write it for them. You'll save your family a lot of time. And you ought to update it about every year. What do you want to be known for? What do you want people to say about you? you write it out. and get, If you're married, give it to your spouse. They have it on file. They're ready. And then give it to your kids and then ask them because they can look at you and say, Daddy, this is what you want to be known for. You better make some different choices. I'm serious. What do we, what do we value? Where are we headed? I don't know about you. I don't want to get to the end of my life and realize I leaned the ladder against the wrong building. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word that speaks so powerfully and relevantly to our life. Even a genealogy like Esau's. And God, I, I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, they're, they're wondering, why in the world would these folks live this kind of way? Why would they make these kind of sacrifices? And maybe it's because they don't know the sacrifice that Christ made for them. Maybe they've never thought about the fact that they're a sinner and that the wages of sin is death. And maybe they've never really pondered that, that Christ didn't have to come for them. But your word says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That you loved them so much that you came for them to solve the greatest issue of their life, which was their sin. To die in their place. To take the punishment that they deserve so that they could have not a bunch of stuff here, but they could have a relationship with you and know that no matter what happens, they would be with you forever and eternity. And God, I pray this morning that you would overwhelm them with your love. You'd overwhelm them not with what they might have to give up. But you'd overwhelm them with what, with what they gain in Christ. And God, for those of us that do know you, just like Jacob, just like David, we, we struggle with a flesh in the midst of an Edomite culture. And it's so easy to get sucked into the Shechem's of life. And God, I pray that... Every day we'd settle the issue. Every day we'd die to ourselves. I pray that every day we'd be reminded this is not our home. We're just passing through. And I pray that we would always be reminded in a world where sometimes it looks like the enemy's winning, that the final chapter has yet to be written. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.